a pinnacle. The farmhouse parlor faced the north, and the cold light made dimmer by the bubbles of green glass in the heavy lattice gave the place a grotto-like aspect. The floor rattled round the sides and covered in the middle with a knitted carpet of yellow and black cloth was made of uneven flags. As much of the walls as was visible between the rows of memorial cards and samplers, and the engraved portraits of eminent divines, from John Wesley to James Cahey, nauseated the unaccustomed beholder with a monstrous design of livid roses festooned with the ribbons of pea green. At the door, Miss Oleran Shaw paused and gazed inward with the devotion of one who prepares to enter a temple. She stooped and held her head sideways to discover if any dust had settled on the high-polished gate-legged table. Its cleanliness proving satisfactory, she folded her cheek duster into the smallest compass and replaced it in the beaded bag that hung at her side and entered and went to the harmonium that stood between the windows. She was a fine middle-aged woman with prominent teeth, a pallid complexion, and a hooked nose. This evening she wore her most imposing gown of steel-gray poplin. As she sat on the high music stool, her back view was like that of a well-developed girl, and her dull, crimped hair was as luxurious as in the days when, as the Methodist local preacher's young daughter, she had caught the fancy of the wealthiest farmer of the countryside. She played the tune of Miles Lane, and began to sing in a voice which, despite its harsh peakland accent and great unpliability, was sweet and clear and strong a doggerel hymn which her father had written in denunciation of all creeds save his own. A maid clattered along the passage and stood waiting with folded hands until Mrs. Oler and Shaw had finished the second verse, which was condemned superstitious fools and Unitarian and Roman Catholic fiends with equal bitterness. There's Mr. Bateman Middleton come, ma'am. Her mistress rose and closed the lid of the harmonium. You can bring him in here, Libby, she said. Be sure and see he wipes his feet well. Then she sat composedly in the big leather-covered armchair with the big lugs in which her husband had slept away his last days. She had just straightened her skirt when Bateman appeared. He was a tall, well-proportioned lad with a broad red face. He had donned for the occasion his fawn-colored holiday suit and his brightest necktie. Mrs. Oler and Shaw shook hands with him and made him take the chair at the other end of the hearthrug. After they had discussed the weather and the oats, she came suddenly to the point. Emma told me as you are coming up to ask to leave the court, she said, and so I thought it would be best for her to be out o'er the road. She was ridden o'er to her uncle Persgrove, and none's coming back till morn. The young man's face saddened. He had hoped for a pleasant family scene, of the kind he had read of in the novels of Mrs. Sherwood's day, which are still the popular fiction of the hill country. He was not uncertain of the mother's favor, there was no complaint to be urged against his position. The farm of the Hallows was his own property, and his brood mares had won prizes three consecutive years at the No Valley Show. Emma was his first love, and he foresaw no disappointment. It's a faith trial as I'm going to test you by, Mrs. Olerenshaw remarked. My father tried it on my husband, and his answer were satisfying. And if yours is, then you have my consent offhand. I'm willing, the lover replied feebly. Him said it would be no use our walking together unless she gave leave. His tone became even more conciliatory. She was a good daughter, and she'll be guided by your will. Well, then, it's this, the widow said. There were a farmer as used to come to our house when I were a wench, and he said, as it happed to his wife, ere they wedded. I want to give my opinion on it. Some believes it, some doesn't. It fell about this way. The young woman were going to Tid's market with the butter. On her way lay across the Middleton Moor. It were a hot day, a hay time, and shoe were dry as a cricket, and there weren't any water or to slack with. Well, she went on and on, till at last she couldn't bear it any longer, and she sat down her basket and looked about. The deep ricks up there where folk used to dig for lead, and all the pit holes are full of green water, covered with scum. It were filthy, but she couldn't forbear, and she just stooped her down. Sooped like a cow till she were full. Then she got up, took her basket, and started on again, but afore she'd walked ten yards somewhat stirred about in her stomach. The old man saw it twisted inside like a live horse hair. The long and the short hut, where she didn't go to Tidza market that day, nay, nor for long enough afterwards. 
She grew white and flabby, and in less than a month were that bad she couldn't leave home. Bateman's mouth opened. Oh dear, he exclaimed. Miss Oleron Shaw sighed when she saw his consternation. Doctors could do a knot for her, she continued, and her folk began to think she were dying. At last someone suggested as the wise man as lived at Hagen Flat might be of some service. So they sent for him, and he came and said it were a panicle shooed swallowed. A panicle? But you'll find it in no book. And he came up the next day at the edge of dark, and made him build up the house fire with fire balls. And there he took the girl and fastened her in a chair with ropes, and tied her hair to the back bars, and turned all out, and locked the door. He kept her afront the blaze till she were nigh roasted. The old man reckoned he were listening outside, and her moans were somewhat fearful. All of a sudden the panicle popped its head out of her mouth and looked around. Then it drew back again, but the wise man had seen it, and he picked up the potter that lay again, and shoved it in the heart of the fire. But the brute wouldn't have come out again, so he moved the young woman till her knees well he touched the grate. She were all covered with blisters afterward. The old chap said, and she had a bad bout to Siphius. The wise man saw the panicles yet come out again, so he popped behind the chair and hid. And it crawled out bit by bit. A beast a picture of a fatty fit, with claws like hands, and a swell body about an arm's length long, and eyes blood red. It let itself down to her breasts, and afore its tail were out of her mouth, its full head were lying in her lap. At last it drew its tail down, and coiled itself up in a knot. And then with one hand, the wise man nipped up the potter, and clapped the utter on the girl's lips, and began to burn the panicle to death. The lover's legs were trembling, his hands slipped from the sides of the chair and hung nerveless. Oh lord, oh lord, he ejaculated. Mrs. Ollernshaw shook her head. She had hardly wished him to pass unscathed from the faith trial, but she was not a woman to be soured by disappointment. When he touched it with a potter, it writhed about like a bit of crosland worsted. Then it stood upright on its hindmost claws and tried to get back again. But his hand, which it bit and caused him to use caustic, were in the way, so it tumbled down and lay on a hearthstone. He laid the potter across it lengthwise. It began screeching like a child, but it were soon a lump of cinder. A long silence followed. Bateman broke it with a tremulous inquiry. Did the young woman get better, ma'am? The man has told us married her, only how? Oh, I never heard such a fearful thing. I'd lie for her died. Mrs. Oler and Shaw rose. So you believe it, Bateman? That I do, ma'am. It's as if I could see it now. Well, I'll say good night to you. Only one has believed such a thing isn't a fit to wed with Emma. He crept dumbfounded from the room. She watched him pass through the garden, then moved by some careful impulse, she followed to the door. Batman, she cried. Come back a moment. He returned hastily, with a glad flush driving away his wanness. Yes, ma'am. Only this, Batman. You mana come courtin' Emma only more. 